And welcome back to the Creative Life show from the American Creativity Association's Austin Global Chapter on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Phyllis Bleese. Joining me today from Vancouver, Canada, is Dr. Haley Simons. She has received international acclaim for her talent as a classical pianist, and she has traveled the world with her musical talent achieving a doctorate of music and certifications as a life coach and an arbitrator. What brings her to the show today is her long-standing and deep dive into the world of creativity. She co-founded Creative Alberta, and she coaches people on accessing their own creative code. We learn about that on our show entitled, Stop Killing the Prodigal Creative. So let's meet Dr. Haley Simons. Aloha, Haley. Aloha, Phyllis. Well, welcome. And just to kind of get a, get a running start here, I should, should let you know, I just watched your performance of Rachmaninoff's Rhapsody on a Theme from Paganini in 2007 with the entire Edmonton Symphony Orchestra as your backup. And I was just enthralled. Uh, you are so talented. You were quiet. You were passionate. You were deep. You were light. And uh, that I hadn't watched you perform before. And I, uh, I was really delighted. And the viewers can find that easily on YouTube. So you've had several lifetimes in your one body. And I wonder, before we get into today's show on all the killing parts, uh, could you tell us how you got to that moment on stage? Oh, that that moment, I remember that moment on stage. Well, that was actually one of, one of the highlights of my performance and um, playing with the Edmonton Symphony Orchestra and a um, dear friend of mine conducting, George Blondheim, who's uh, passed recently. Uh, sadly, two years ago, and that that moment was the culmination of so many years of piano lessons. And of course, it starts very young, starting at three years old. Um, my parents were I had I was so fortunate I had such supportive parents and supportive family. And as I was going through school, piano was my um, piano was my my thing. And um, even though my, my parents were divorced and I was raised by my mother, single mother, and we didn't have, um, we didn't have much money at all. We lived in, in the low rentals uh, across from the refinery in Edmonton, Alberta. And the entire time, even though we didn't have um, a lot of money, my mother made so many sacrifices. I had private piano lessons and I also had private art lessons. And the art, I remember the art teacher coming to my house and we would have private lessons. So I never suffered. She always valued uh, the artistic training. Um, I went on after that to um, university. I stayed in, in Alberta, I went to the University of Alberta. And then I was really fortunate to meet um, one of the most uh, amazing musicians I've had the the pleasure of knowing in my life, John Perry, and um, went to Texas actually to study with John Perry at Rice University. And after that came back to Alberta to finish my, my doctorate degree in piano performance. So there was a lot of piano studying going on behind the scenes there. Um, that uh, That particular performance, it was um, uh, probably one of the highlights of my career, I would say. And it was from that moment, shortly thereafter, that things started to change <laughs> for me quite drastically. Well, you know, I, I mean, you're not a classical pianist today, professionally, that's not your primary calling. And I'm re we're, we're really interested in how we got to the killing part of today's show. And so there's like some history and some story between then and now. What happened? You know, what were some of the key events in your life that brought into your skill set and your field of awareness ways that we could access our own 
creativity. So let's start with the events. And then I want to ask you a couple questions. I know the audience wants to know what's a prodigal creative and are we killing them? Who are they? So that was a lot. So if you just give us a little bit of the history then between why you why you're now teaching creativity pretty much full time. Actually, when when I was performing, I was always teaching. So it was a um, simultaneous uh, uh, profession for me. And I remember teaching these wonderful students. And and for me, it was never about teaching the nuances of a Mozart sonata. It was always about relating with the student. And I would have these uh, gifted wonderful, bright young people sitting on my piano bench, uh, lamenting their schooling. And we would talk about that. And there was really no opportunity in their education for any kind of creativity. They were very focused on academics. They were focused, even their their piano training seemed to be um, an accoutrement. It was just a, a, a side um, activity. And they were fortunate. These were the fortunate kids. And I started thinking about what the less fortunate kids were enduring, going through school and not having the benefit of private art lessons or private piano lessons. And that led me to pursuing um, advocacy efforts to try and make sure that at least these kids were engaged in school. I mean, that was the least we could do as a civilized society, I thought. And I was uh, lucky enough to have a series of events happen very closely. I um, was introduced to and shortly thereafter met Daniel Pink when he came to our small community in, so in Edmonton. Tell us, so tell, tell yeah. some of his books. You want to share with them who Daniel Pink is? Well, Daniel Pink is a, a well-known, uh, celebrated author, and it was his book, A Whole New Mind, that talks about left brain and right brain. And finally, I... I found somebody who is understanding exactly what I was going through and what these kids were going through and and dealing with creativity in the one side of the brain and how it's been neglected and and of course this now seems so long ago it was it was shortly after that that I met um, Sir Ken Robinson's group and uh, especially uh, Susan McCalmont from Creative Oklahoma was such an inspiration to me and I decided well this is a really cool group to start hanging around with. These are the folks who who know where where we need to be headed in in our society. So I decided to start a nonprofit of our own, and we started Creative Alberta. And we wanted to essentially mimic what the advocacy efforts were uh, that Susan was doing in Oklahoma. And we advocated um, government and education systems for creativity. And, um, and, and that became all encompassing for a while and, and really, for me, really rewarding. And it was, uh, it was that, that, that I thought I was going to be spending the rest of my days pursuing the advocacy efforts. It was, it, it felt like that was my purpose. And so let me, let me have you pause there for a minute, because I wanted the audience to know how, um, troubled you were when we were first preparing for this show about what really you told the story that for your whole life that that there was this there were these litmus tests to identify the gifted and identify the creative and that it came became more about labels and about being it was more about doing than being and the, and that that you felt like it, the the creativity in people was was ignored or beaten down uh, and sort of lost in this in this rush to be identified as created and get get the labels. And you even you even said that Chat GPT recently had uh, passed the, the 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 some well known creativity tests that uh, in our world in the creativity world uh, have been noted for identifying people who are creative. It. It they chat GPT um, passed it. So and I heard and I was just listening a couple of days ago that it's also passed the uh, the SATs for uh, and the LSATs for people applying for college and law school in the United States that chat GPT has passed those those um, those tests. So those standardized tests. So talk a little bit too about your feeling angst around 
how we're nurturing and bringing out the creativity. And I know you have some stories to tell us about people whose creativity is not nourished have actually committed suicide. So I know we have a robust set of stories for you to share with us today. And just want to, which ones that we have time to have you cover? Sure. Oh, there are so many. Um, if if we start with the the Creative Alberta and the Creative Oklahoma and the National Creativity Network, that network of people, I was really uh, quite enamored with Sir Ken's TED Talk, Our Schools do schools kill creativity? It's still the most watched TED Talk, 75 million viewers. And um, today, all of those 75 million viewers have been uh, operating with the this understanding, this definition of creativity. As, as Sir Ken said, um, it's the, the process of creating something novel and of value. And for me, it, it formed almost an existen existential crisis because I thought I had identified as a creative my entire life. I started very, very young. And then with that definition that everyone seemed to have adopted, I felt actually out-labeled from being a creative. I had never created anything new or of value that I could remember. I was just a, a mimicking. I was, I was the translator of some long past European, usually male, who wrote something on paper and I would translate it and I never created anything new in my life. So it was, it was a moment for me when I had to really re-examine, well, may, maybe I'm not creative. And I felt like an outlier in all of those areas anyway. I didn't belong to a government agency. I had no uh, authority with the education system. And so my advocacy efforts started to feel a little disempowered and a little disingenuous. I could recognize creativity as valuable, but I couldn't find, I couldn't find the appropriate definition and I felt excluded. So I felt like an outlier on, on many fronts. And about that moment where I was having that crisis, I was also having a, a personal change and uh, I suddenly found myself as a single mom and a single mom trying to support two kids with an artist schedule is not very conducive to mothering. So I made a career shift and entered the, the field of law. I was very fortunate to have a family in, in that field and they generously gave me a position knowing the situation I was in. So I had a complete uh, 180 shift in my life. And all of a sudden, it was like being hit by a, a, a cement truck, because when you enter that field, it feels like nobody is really operating with the same creative background. Nobody wanted to hear a story. Nobody wanted to connect. There was very little human interaction. I remember, Phyllis, in one of your, um, one of your past interviews, you actually talked about when you went through your law school training and, and you said that that you all came out as machines. And, and I found that after we were talking, actually quite ironic because everyone, and you're very creative and you came through the school process feeling like a machine. And yet we have this machine, literal machine now, the chat GPT and the artificial intelligence that's able to pass in the very, very top percentile of the Torrance creativity testing. And the Torrance testing was uh, traditionally or earlier uh, given in the 60s to schools to try and identify whether a child was creative, um, meaning gifted or not. And that kind of labeling happened then. Well, now we have ChatGPT feeling very, very creative indeed. And all of these really creative, very intelligent individuals coming out of school feeling like machines. So that that's a, a stark contrast as well. If we were to then segue and talk further about this uh, this legal industry, which, uh, as you know, it's it's um, probably one of the most uh, dangerous occupations, apparently, after all of the the research and and studies through um, uh, through even the the American Bar Association and the T Lab information that we spoke about earlier, and um, it's. It, 
it, it hit home that I wasn't alone, that actually there are people in this industry who might be feeling the same way I'm feeling, which was not very comfortable at all. In fact, it was um, really uncomfortable and um, very, very dissonant. Well, let me let me reframe. So, because you're talking about the law, and the 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 profession of law, and a lot of people would think that's that's a quintessentially creative services industry. And but then you talked about it feeling oppressive. And I know you told me stories that you had two or three colleagues, 27 years old, and the last year that committed suicide. And they're they're in. So there's there's this talk about dissonance. There's a complete disconnect or or maybe two realities going on. And one is winning out that you're feeling uh, you're feeling desperate and unhappy and sick and miserable. What and and what what did you do when you found yourself in that? You talked about it being toxic. You said it was literally toxic to me. And how did are you still in that industry? Are you still working in law firms? Uh, what happened if you aren't to get you out of it? And what what do you see as a solution to the toxic toxicity that we're finding? And maybe are all of our professions or our day jobs? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Uh, really big question. Um, at at the I'm I'm going to say almost at the pinnacle of of the the stressful um, climb for me. Um, I was in one office that um, uh, we we had two young people working in our office, and they were they were both uh, young in their twenties. One was twenty seven, and the other might have been twenty seven as well. Um, they both tried to commit suicide. They both attempted suicide. Uh, sadly, one succeeded, and and it was um, it was devastating it was devastating the shortly after and and uh yeah shortly after that it was within one month uh two other 27 year olds i know who i were i was close to um who were also artists and and um the one 27 year old who whose life ended was just a an amazing, sensitive, beautiful talent, lovely, lovely young woman, and clearly unable to survive in that in that situation. Uh, and then the two others, almost uh, with, within one month. So, so it was it was shocking, it was startling, and and it uh, it was almost too tragic at the time to even try and try and make sense of it. I mean, how, how can you make sense of it? Uh, eventually you have to say, well, well, why, why did this happen? And, and, and to what end are we entering this, this industry if this is what it's doing to us? And uh, I know we've prepared um, uh, one of the slides. When, when talking about it, it had to, it had to, there had to be a cause. And mm -hmm. even if there were no answers to it, when you start looking at the statistics and the, the divorce rate in, in the legal profession being 27% and, and a 36% substance abuse, and that's from the American Bar Association, uh, the, the Betty Ford Foundation study, 36% and the average in all um, highly educated professions is 6.8. So it's startling. The um, mental health is an issue. 28% of, of legal professionals suffer from depression. And then probably the most startling and, um, uh, well, close to home is 11.5% have at some point in their careers had suicidal thoughts. It's 11.5% of people wanting to end their life because of, because of a career, because of a job. Um, because of this system that they find themselves in, and 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 to me, that's that's a tragedy. That's not 
that's not why we're here. So whether it then um, informed some other existential crisis in myself, at least it, 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 it caused me to ask the question, what, why are we here? What are we here for? We're certainly not here to be uh, um, producers and consumers. And, and there has to be some larger answer. I know I'm not the first to ask this. I know there, there are long lines of um, uh, people through the centuries asking this, this same question, but there has to be an answer. And I so, thought, so is this, is this where the product, because we have this question, what is the prodigal creative and are we killing them? Who's the prodigal creative? Are we killing them? And can you help us get, get ourselves out of that? Um, maybe we could, you've got it. We've got a slide here. It's kind of, I don't, I don't know quite what it means on slide five, Michael, maybe you could speak to this and let, let us know on slide five. Yeah, what what are we seeing here? Is this is this the person who's in crisis? Talk to us a little bit. I'm just wondering if those people that are going through crisis are they the prodigal creative like in us? Are they the ones we want to invite to come back home if we follow the parable? You know, do we need to invite them back into our lives? And 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 if so, why and how do we do that? Well, for me the the moment came with this self reflection and and actually reexamining this shift back to creativity um i left the legal profession uh relatively recently i i escaped i i believe with my life i remember one day mm. walking through the door and it was so stressful um i turned around and unbolted the door again just in case the emergency personnel needed to come back in if I was having a heart attack because I felt that constriction around my neck. I remember thinking I'm really fortunate to live across the street from the emergency department in Vancouver. And that that for me was uh, a full, full stop. And it was one small return to a creative activity, um, actually through a beautiful online course with Kat Coroy and learning about Canva and learning about who we are and our soul essence that made me think this, this is me. And it's not just me, it's, it's who we all are. And that perhaps all along, this definition of creativity needs to expand into not something we do, but something we are. We're just born creative. And that is my philosophy. I'm pretty sure I'm not alone in that. And then I realized that it is really like returning to the talents and the, the parable of the prodigal creative, of course, um, squandering the talents. I felt like I had squandered my talents. I felt like I had squandered the time and completely uh, abandoned everything I was doing before, whether it was musical or creative, uh, went off on a different path. And then it was me reclaiming that. And this time I felt very proud to reclaim it. And I felt this was something who I am fundamentally as, as a person. And this is, I, I called it my holy shift. So, <laughs> so let's, let's show, because we've only got maybe three minutes left and we're going to be pointing the audience to your websites and you're starting a course this fall and how to, how they can reclaim their creative self and save their lives. We've got in slide six, we've got some of the benefits of reclaiming your creativity. I, you can speak to that, Haley. You've got four categories there that greatly benefit when we reclaim our prodigal creative. Uh, the, the, there are creativity stats. I mean, I can read those really quickly. We have improved brain function, 73% improved brain function, emotional resilience, uh, stress reduction after 45 minutes of even very, very poor creative activities uh, results in a 75% lowered cortisol level. We all know stress is killing us. Stress is one of yeah. the, if not the largest killer, but 63% but um, less likelihood of uh, a, a acquiring dementia this is this these are startling statistics they i'm are. still not sure i'm not sure why everybody isn't um really really grabbing onto this and i know this is about the creative life and and I, these statistics are are not my own 
They are well researched. It, this is certainly nothing new. Um, I thought, if only I can try and help people help help them reclaim who they are in this world, which is creative beings. I believe we're all here to create, create first, consume second. And it's that creator that I want to reacquaint people with, which is basically themselves. I think that's going to be the key to, to empowering so, everyone. So in less than a minute, if we could show slide seven, there's a creative code that you've developed that you're going to start teaching this fall. We can leave that in the crib notes that go with the show's library, but could, this is the basics of your creative code. So you want to go through that with us just to just to put a teaser out there to what you're going to spend, what, nine, how many months will you spend going over these four steps? Actually, it's a very uh, short, um, uh, these are four of eight steps. It's uh -huh. a short eight step program, an eight week program, but it will exist in an online platform. So you can redo it over and over and over and oh. over again, what it's intended for. So instead of just having a book, and I have lots of wonderful books that have all been very inspiring to me, um, but after I read them once, essentially they stay on the shelf. I okay. want you know what? We're going to have to leave it there, actually. So we will we'll let the audience slow it down and look at the music of the spheres and the imagination. Viva voce and amor fate, reprising our guest Joss Kite's love of amor fate. So you'll you'll learn more about that uh, with Haley's work that you can find online. And you have been watching the creative life from the American Creativity Association's Austin Global Chapter on Think Tech Hawaii. Today, we've been talking with our guest, Dr. Haley Simons, to learn how to stop killing the creative prodigal in all of us by using our own unique creative code. So mahalo, Haley, for joining us. Mahalo. Oh, mahalo, nui loa, Phyllis. That's it. <laughs> And mahalo to our viewers for tuning in. Our hearts are, of course, going out to those that are rebuilding uh, from the fires in Maui. We're, we're very aware that this precious life is just that. And uh, I'm Phyllis Bleece. We'll be back in two weeks with another edition of our show, The Creative Life. Aloha. <laughs>